Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Labyrinth, a podcast produced by Virtual Executive Director. My name is Becky Brett, and I'm your host. I'm an intuitive executive coach for artists, content creators, and entrepreneurs. And oh my gosh, I am so excited to bring you this week's episode with Emmy-nominated songwriter Tom Miser. But first, have you ever thought of working with a coach? If you feel stuck in your life and business, and a lot of times with us creative types, those are one and the same thing, a coach like me can help you get unstuck and back into your groove. So I prefer to work with clients one-on-one, and we use the mantra of the labyrinth, which is release, receive, return, to guide our sessions. When you work with me, the kinds of results you can expect are to build relationships that support you and your work, uh, to dramatically reduce the stress in your life, and even find more time for the people and the things that you love. So far, my most successful clients have come to me when they are building or birthing something new, or they're facing a major life change. They seek me out to help them shed old habits, beliefs, and thought patterns in order to fully launch themselves into their new life or project. Now, if this sounds like you, fill out the application linked here in the show notes. And if I think we'll be a good fit, I'll contact you to schedule a quick call. And guys, look, don't worry, it's not a high pressure sales situation, because I'm the one interviewing you. Okay, this week on the podcast, I take a stroll through the labyrinth with Thomas Miser. Tom is an award winning writer whose work has appeared on stages and screens of various sizes and shapes around the world. As a songwriter, he co-wrote five original songs for the hit Amazon series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. This was the first time this series has ever used original music and includes the Emmy-nominated One Less Angel. As a lyricist and librettist, he was awarded the Fred Ebb Award, which is one of the highest honors for excellence in theater songwriting, and was the recipient of a Jonathan Larson grant from the American Theater Wing, both for his musical theater collaborations with his writing partner, Curtis Moore. Their credits together include commissions from the Lincoln Center and the Williamstown Theater Festival, as well as upcoming musicals for Universal Theatrical Group and Grove Whitman Commissions, producers of Fun Home and The Band's Visit. Miser and Moore's romantic mystery, Triangle, premiered at TheaterWorks Silicon Valley to rave reviews and went on to receive six Theater Bay Area Awards, including Outstanding World Premiere Musical, as well as being named a Richard Rogers Award finalist by the American Academy of Arts and Letters. In addition to his songwriting, Tom is an acclaimed copywriter for national media brands, including Comedy Central, Amazon Studios, and Food Network. Please welcome to the labyrinth, Tom Miser. Let's, uh, I guess, begin our stroll down uh, down memory lane a little bit. Let's start with Northwestern, where we met theater majors. Um, because you, okay, so everyone, now Tom is like living in LA and he's nominated for an Emmy and uh, doing all the really cool things. I want to explore a little bit how you got from Evanston to where you are now. Of course. Though I will say, like, if you had asked me in college, nothing that I'm doing now is what I would have thought I was doing. So it makes it sound like a direct line, but it is so far from the direct line (laughs) and so different than what I was doing at Northwestern. So I think that's important to sort of say from the beginning. It's not like I was a theater major and now I'm up for an Oscar for acting or something, you know, it's, it's, right. it's yeah. such a random uh, journey. It is. It's a, it's a meandering path. And I think a lot of people forget that. I mean, like to look at you now, it's like, Ooh, you, you know, here you are, <laughs> but um, it's been a while. It's been a minute since we graduated and a lot has happened between now and then. So, all right. So what happened right after, let's say right after graduation, like you're a fresh new actor, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'd always been writing uh, in college as well. So uh, I was a theater major and an English major. In fact, oh, okay. uh, my acting teacher called me the uh, theater major who read. 
because <laughs> I was I was taking English. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Yeah, I don't know about <laughs> that. <either. laughs> I'm like mildly insulted. Yeah. Well, she was. Yeah. That's a whole other story. <laughs> um, but I had I had always been doing both, but I left and immediately was acting. I was lucky. I was in a show uh, as an actor uh, called Schoolhouse Rock Live. Oh yeah. Right out of college, that was Scott just a Ferguson. Little- Shout out yeah. to Scott <laughs> Ferguson and the whole team, uh, Nina Lynn. They it was a it was a basement show, but it took off. Mm-hmm. It was it was just a late night show that we did once or twice a week, and then uh, it built and built until we had a long run in Chicago, and uh, we moved to New York and had an off Broadway run. So that was very atypical um, to to so quickly be working and to have the opportunity to have a reason to move to New York mm. with a job. Uh, but uh, then the reality of New York set in. Mm, tell me about that. Like, was there like a, a specific moment where you were like, oh, shit, I'm in New York? <laughs> well, again, I was lucky in that uh, I was with this show that brought me there with a job and... So I had the safety net of arriving feeling, you know, I I was able to get an agent when I arrived because of the show and that kind of stuff. But very quickly, uh, I, once the show ended, I realized it was a, uh, I was going to be a, you know, I'd been, been a bigger fish in a semi large pond in Mm -hmm. Chicago, but in New York, I was going to be a small fish in a very big pond. Mm. And that the talent level was going to be at a level that I had to up my game. And, uh, you know, right away after the show closed, I had a, you know, I was working the retail job, folding sweaters and had to take whatever I could get to make money in New York. Mm. And the dream of like, oh, it, this is so easy. I'm going to roll from show to show to show mm. that that's not going to happen. Mm. Uh, and certainly not for me. Uh, I learned quickly that I had talents, but that I was not going to be the, the triple threat that mm. makes it easier to work in New York, you know, mm. that I had skills and I was good, but I wasn't that top of everything that you need to be to be yeah. a performer at that level. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying, yeah, as in you didn't have talent. I'm saying, yeah, <laughs> as in it is really brutal. Like it, it's, I mean, it's not an easy life. Um, so, okay. So you're folding sweaters, taking kind of whatever, were, were there any like memorable disasters oh, uh, you want to share? <laughs> disasters. Um, I, you know, the, what I look back and laugh at are the, the sort of the little gigs you take the, the, you know, I had a, I was in a commercial where I was stuffed in a phone booth with 10 guys pretending to be frat guys <laughs> you know, you, what am I doing? Uh, there's the, the summer of doing extra work that I had just mm-hmm. to keep my insurance going and, and uh, you know, being on set as the hundredth person to the left, mm. you know, just to, you know, get some money into my bank account so that I could continue to doing, doing what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's such a random life that you just have to kind of roll with. Um, yeah. In fact, that, that was the best advice I ever got was, uh, so I forget even who told me this, but it's sort of been my guiding principle, which is um, you can point your ship where you want to go, but the waves are going to come and take you in other directions. So mm. point the ship, but don't be upset when the waves come and sort of take you and you got to follow where your ship's going. You can't just yeah. swerve the wheel and hope to go back where you were headed. Um, you got to work your way back around. Yeah. So, okay. So you're folding sweaters, you're being an extra. And then at what point are you like, "Mm, I'm actually a songwriter. Well, luckily uh, my writing partner, Curtis Moore, who I met in college, we had already written a little bit and we'd been writing through college, some songs. There was a big show called the Wami show at Northwestern, which is an all singing, all dance and all sparkly show written by students, Mm -hmm. which uh, paired us together. And uh, we'd been writing a little bit while I was acting, I would come and go, but he was always a consistent force in my life, someone who I would always come back to. Mm -hmm. And 
the moment came, uh, I was actually uh, very lucky. I had gotten a really great job as an actor. Um, I went on, on tour for two years in, on the first national tour of Blue's Clues Live. Oh which <laughs> This tells you a lot about my acting career that my two biggest gigs ended with live exclamation point. <laughs> um, that that's you know and I it was an amazing job it was I got to tour the country as the star of the show yes it was for five-year-olds but it was actually a it was it was a much better show than it needed to be it was written mm. by some smart people it had a lot of improv in it it was a great message the kids treated me like I was Elvis oh, and, yeah you were yeah and and you know as a as a quirky character actor to be standing, standing center stage on the stage at Radio City for two weeks, oh sing a song to 5,000 people. It was a dream come true. And it was yeah. it's something that I will always treasure because it was the best job and, uh, and taught me a lot. And I worked hard and it was very rewarding. But the interesting thing was, is right during this sort of success that was happening, I sort of had an epiphany of, I would come back to the city on a break in the show and I was back at square one. Mm. Even though I had this great job, I'm back in line auditioning and I wanted more control over my artistic life. Mm. Uh, as an actor, you have to wait for someone to hire you to act. I mean, you can act in front of your mirror, but it's, that's not what it's about. It's about communicating and being with other people and being on a stage or on a set. Mm -hmm. And you have to wait for that. And I was always writing and finding that uh, I loved that with writing, I could always write. Even if, even if no one was going to hire me, I could sit down and set the time aside and be creative and, and work on my my artistic self. Mm. And that was really important to me. And that in conjunction with the knowledge that to be an actor at the level, if I was going to take the next step as an actor, I needed to devote myself, you know, everything else had to go away. Like if you want to be that person, if you want to be that person on stage on Broadway as a lead, or you want to be on TV, it's very rare that you don't have to give up the rest of your life to do it. Mm. You know, I saw that if there's a sort of singular focus that has to come. Mm. And I just didn't have that. I didn't have that. I loved it, but I didn't have that. Everything else has to go away. I want this desperately. Mm -hmm. And if you don't was want it hard, that, Was it hard to release that part of you? Um, it still is. That's not something you ever, you know, I still think of myself as an actor sometimes. And I, I jokingly say, you know, I've kept my, my SAG card. Uh, I haven't used it in years except as a bathroom in New York City, you know, when <laughs> I'm walking around town that I can get into the, the union office. But um, I, I realized what was important for me and that carries it through. I, yeah, there's disappointment sometimes. You have that, you have that, that sort of 10-year-old voice that imagined yourself on the stage at the Oscars. Mm that never quite goes away, that can be disappointing, but I don't, I, I can laugh at that a little bit and I can, I can see the realities of the world and see that the life that I've, I've had so far is great and fun and random and wonderful. And if it didn't look like that, that perfect vision, well, of course that happens to one out of a million people and yeah. that's okay. That is yeah. okay. Well, I think that those 10 year old boy dreams got you to where you are now. So thanks. Yeah. Ten -year -old Tom. <laughs> yeah. 10 year old Tom would be thrilled with where I am now. And, and it just would be different and that's okay. Yeah. And that's important to let yourself off that hook. Cause sometimes we hang on to, you know, I have friends who hang on to that, but I, I said I was going to do this again. It goes back to my metaphor of the boat. Mm -hmm. Your boat sinks. If you go into that wave, You've mm -hmm. got to ride the wave and yeah. then you can repoint it when you have, when the waves are past, point it again, but don't let it sink you. Yeah. I think a lot of times we forget that, um, that it'll always be there for us too. I mean, 
like it's it's a part of us and so we can always go back to it mm-hmm. it's never completely gone when someone when i'm 60 and can play the goofy neighbor i am <laughs> gonna be there i'm gonna be ready with my headshot to, to do that um <laughs> But I feel like I didn't quite finish answering your question, which was, oh, yeah, yeah. I came off, I came off tour after this amazing experience. And I said, I have money in the bank. I'm going to write. It was the strangest thing. Like here I was coming off this big success that seemingly, you know, I could, I could parlay into other things. And I said, I want to write. And I have the opportunity to do that. And I have the opportunity to control my destiny instead of being at the back of the equity line again. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And I sort of focused again with Curtis and we started considering ourselves a writing team really more so than, I mean, we'd always been writing and there's stuff before Blue's Clues that, that we had done, but the fork in the road happened and I went, unhesitatingly down that path and then you know i i can look back now with some hindsight to see why i did that but um at the time it just made sense i trusted Mm. that felt right it felt like what i wanted to do and it wasn't an easier career that's for sure (laughs) like to go from (laughs) acting to writing musical theater is (laughs) not going from to an easier career right like niching super far yeah. down <laughs> now, we're talking about one and you know if, if getting a job as an actor is that one in a thousand thing now i'm talking about there are five people who consistently write music theater and get paid for it there yeah. are five <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe i wasn't the smartest of creatures but i knew and it so- seems to be working out for you okay though it's, it is and, and in ways that are unexpected that yeah. is always the, the thread yeah. Um, did Curtis move out West too? Or He didn't. Um, I'm actually only in LA. I've been in LA for two years after 20 some years in New York. Um, wow. But I'm actually in, in LA uh, because of my husband's job. Uh, ah. He got a job. Uh, he got an op- opportunity to work in LA at a great company. And uh, we had a sort of a family discussion about it and realized that I can do my job anywhere. Yeah. And Curtis and I have worked together long enough that we can work remotely. We were, we were singularly prepared for the pandemic because we, <laughs> we already worked this way. And uh, um, so I made the move and made the leap. And it was, again, fortuitous timing to, to trust that leap because now we're getting more involved with TV and film. And so yeah. I have a presence out here to, to take those meetings. But nice. I'm still a New York guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have, I mean, what's been the biggest, um, the biggest adjustment between New York and LA? Oh, wow. Um, it was rough the first year. Yeah. The first year for me was tough. Not, the work part was fine. Curtis and I were able to continue working. Um, but it was about... Uh, I missed the interaction with people. New York is a city where you can't help but bump into people, literally mm-hmm. and figuratively. And as a, as a slight hermit writer dude, mm-hmm. it's good to be forced into life. And the subway forces you into life. Mm-hmm. Uh, LA, I could s- sit on my little apartment balcony and never interact with another human being. Ex- you know, I, I can sit in my car. Maybe I'm in line at the the Sprouts grocery store with someone, but you don't, you don't have that mixing. Yeah. Um, and that's hard. And it's also hard to make new friends when that's the case. Uh, luckily I have a few trusted old friends that were in, in California, but uh, that, that was hard. It yeah. was a hard transition. Does that affect your writing? Uh, I think it did. I think it, um, it necessarily, uh, for a time, I thought it was a positive that, okay, well, I'll just focus more on the writing, but you need life to infuse your work. Mm. And I think that I got a little depressed and it was harder to write. I had all this time, but I wasn't feeling creative because I wasn't uh, just wasn't in my skin, wasn't feeling as alive for a while. Yeah. Um, and luckily, got a, we got a great job that pushed me out of myself and got me involved with people. but. Um, 
And yeah, what job was that? <laughs> uh, we were asked to write the songs, some original songs for the marvelous Mrs. Maisel um, for the third season of the show, which was a dream job, a dream come true job. But that also, again, to I know I'm sounds like I'm being too uh, perfectly thematic, but it was such a left turn and such a random journey to that job. Uh -huh. You know, it wasn't something we were pursuing. We had we had not we had not said no to ever writing for TV and film, but we weren't pursuing it actively. We weren't doing a lot of outreach, and so and how did well? How did it? How did it come to you? Uh, so. I'll tell the sort of medium version of the story instead of the okay. longest version. But the medium version is uh, we had a show, that, a musical we had written called Triangle, um, which is sort of, it's a, a romantic mystery set in the building where the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire happened mm -hmm. in New York. And, um, and a producer saw it, a Broadway producer named Scott Sanders, and some of his team saw it and recommended that we come in for a meeting. And they said, the show's not for us. We don't think it's a Broadway show. It's a lovely show, but it's not big enough to be Broadway, which I totally understood. Mm -hmm. But he said, we want to work with you. And which was great. And a, and a great uh, step forward to have someone like that support you. And during our process of working, trying to find material to work on with them, they set us up on a blind date with Amy Sherman Palladino, who's the creator of Maisel and Gilmore Girls. Mm -hmm. And she loves music theater. And her dream has always been to write a musical. And Scott, the producer, said, hey, I think I have this, this property I'd like to have adapted to a musical. Amy's the right person to do it. I think you guys could be the right people to do it. And so we had, we had a blind date with her. <laughs> uh, we hit it off. Um, <laughs> She is everything you hope she would be if you love oh her. Oh my shows. God, I do, I do. I'm a Gilmore Girls. I, I mean, it is like being with oh. the Gilmore Girls or with Maisel oh in the room. God. She, she just is the funniest, like, fast talking. Can you even keep thing. up? Yeah. Sometimes I just sit back and I'm pleased if I can throw out one comment that makes her laugh. Then I feel like my day is done. I have, I have, I have survived. But um, anyway, we we hit it off. Decided to to write a musical together. Uh, we start working on this property and she said to us, this was a couple years ago, she said, uh, I have to do this Amazon show. It's this little show, I'm gonna do the pilot, no one's gonna watch it, and in six months I'll be back and we'll, we'll really work on the musical. And of course, that was The Marvelous <laughs> Mrs. Basil, which was not a little show. And no. it was a huge hit. And yeah. We didn't see her very often. Uh, we kept in touch and she's been lovely to us and we would work like one weekend a year that she had free, mm. uh, but that's no way to write a musical. Yeah. Uh, so. I know. And so by uh, 2059, you'll have Exactly. And, and I'm telling you, it still might happen in 2059. <laughs> we, we still talk about it. We still have a meeting about the musical every once in a while, but it, it's, go, it's slow going. Uh, it's fun going. Let me tell you. Yeah. But uh, the great thing was, is that three years later, after our weekend a year, we we're on the phone with her, just ch chatting and teasing her. We were teasing her about, uh, we should at least write the theme song to your next show. And she stopped and went, wait, I need songs for Maisel next season. Do you guys think you could do it? <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> that was the quickest yes I've ever said in my life. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, sometimes people don't, s they see you one in one place and they don't see how you can, you have to remind them that you can do mm. other things or that that can work someplace else. And yeah. uh, it was, you know, I don't know, maybe she had already thought about it. Knowing her, she probably did, but it certainly seemed like it was just that moment. And that was it. It was, it was so casual and out of the left field. And we, within, within a week, were having to write. And within a month and a, and a half, just under a month and a half, we were on set shooting two of the songs. I mean, it oh was my gosh. whiplash. It was wow. very fast, very stressful, very intense. But It takes a lot of, and let's not downplay this, a lot of preparation, skill, and talent 
to be open to receiving that kind of serendipity. That is, you have, you have nailed it. That is what we have said is people, people are like, Oh, it's so great that you got this, you know, this opportunity. And we, we've said again and again, we were able to do what we did because we had that 20 years of experience. Mm -hmm. If we hadn't had all those steps along the way, we would have been terrified and dropped that ball when it was thrown at us. But because of the experience we had and the time put in to, to do the work, we walked in confidently. I mean, we were terrified because this is a <laughs> great show where everyone's, it's not just a TV show, it's a show that had won more Emmys than anyone else and was like, everybody's A-list. Everybody's the top of their game. That sound guy to, to the cast, to Amy and Dan, they're the best in the business. And you know that, and you realize I have to, I have to step up to that game. And luckily, as scared as we were, as you are with anything like that, um, we felt we can do this. We've, we've got the skills. We've, we've worked our whole life to have this opportunity and we're going to just do our best, do what we do. Don't overthink it. Just do what we do. And, uh, and luckily the time element also helped. It was so fast. The initial two songs, yeah. um, that. Which were the first two that you wrote and recorded? Uh, the first two that they filmed were uh, One Less Angel, mm-hmm. which is the, the, the one we uh, were ending on there for, yeah. and uh, Bottle of Pop, which was the girl group song. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I was wondering if you wrote that one too. Yeah, yeah. There are five of our songs throughout the season, <laughs> and that one, that one's fun. Bottle of Pop. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. It's just so adorable. I can't understand <laughs> it. And that was, it was a lot of fun to work with the backup girls. I mean, at heart, I want to be a Supreme. So <laughs> it's like, finally, I was given the opportunity to sort of live that fantasy. Um, uh, quick question then. Uh, if you were, if you got your wish and could be a Supreme, uh, what would your wig look like? I'm, I'm a, sh- a short of stature young man. Not so young anymore, but I'll just say young man. I would definitely go high. I mean, yeah. I would I would tease that beehive up so that it's basically like I am half hair. That's what I would do. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, anything, anything to get some added height. Um, yeah, crazy. I know, just a little detour on the path. I mean, Please. it's a winding path, you know. It has to be. It has to be. I would I would expect nothing less of a conversation between us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so okay. Yeah, I'm like sort of flooded with memories. Um, we, one of the early shows you worked on was uh, My One and Only, right? That was the first. Was that where we met? Well, I did in college. I was a freshman. I was yeah. short, bad, and in the back. <laughs> no, you, weren't you one of the three, the trio no, guys? No, 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 oh, no. Okay. I had never tapped a day in my life. <laughs> the only reason I was cast in that show is because it's hard to find college guys who can sing act and move at the same time Mm. like I wasn't a dancer but I could keep I could move and so they stuck tap shoes on me and (laughs) I still have shin splints thanks to that show oh no (laughs) that was a blast and a joy but and I can still do some of the tap from it because it was drummed into me so intensely yeah that was a joyful show uh Bobby DeWitt who directed it uh, was just has such a way with musicals. Um, mm-hmm. God, that was so much fun. And the choreographer, Karen, uh, yeah. what's her last name? I can't remember her last name. She ended up, here we go. She ended up, uh, was one of the choreographers of Schoolhouse Rock Live. Oh. Um, so those, those threads of family and people that you work with, mm-hmm. when you, anytime anyone asks me, like, you know, you get those sort of, you have those moments of working with like high school students or college students and they're asked, what's the one piece of advice you would give?" And I, this, it's the same, no matter who you talk to, be nice, Mm. be kind Mm. to people you work with because you never know who you're going to run against up with again, who you're going to be meeting at that meeting 10 years later, who goes, you were fun to work with. You were a nice person. There's everybody's talented at a certain level. Once you get to a certain place, mm-hmm. it's going to make a difference is who do you want to be stuck with in tech for <laughs> 10 out of 12s? Who do you want at that table? That's going to be fun to be with. 
And so yeah. be nice. Be yeah. Calm. I mean, you can't, you really can't lose when you start, when you lead with love and compassion and mm-hmm. empathy and kindness and all the things that make people feel good. Yeah. Try. There's some days you're cranky. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, it happens. It <laughs> happens. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but like, uh, I've been talking to a lot of people lately who uh, we're all kind of suffering from an oxytocin deficit right now. And it makes it harder to like, okay, I lead with love, empathy, compassion. (laughs) Someone someone please hug me. Yeah. We are caged animals right now that, and we are, you know, we, we have grooming in our DNA. We like to be touched. We like Mm. someone to touch us. We like to be hugged, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's part of our life. So, okay. You get yes. to this point where you can receive, uh, you've, uh, you've been able to receive um, the new gig with Maisel. Um, tell me about this Emmy experience. Is this your <laughs> first time? Yeah, this it? is the first time at the rodeo. Uh, <laughs> we, and it is the strangest, I mean, ever, we call it the COVID Emmys. <laughs> Everyone keeps telling us, well, normally what would be happening is this, but it, it's so far from normal in every way. And it, uh, it's a good reminder to my ego because that 10-year-old boy wanted nothing more than, I was obsessed with award shows. I loved mm-hmm. them. I would, the one thing I would do is stay up to watch the Oscars every year. I could predict the winners. Like at a very young age, I was strange that, that way. So there's a certain um, uh, f- dream fulfilledness about this moment. I'm actually, the Emmys are one of the big ones. We have an Emmy nomination. This is right. everything that 10 year old boy would have wanted, but it's none of the parties. It's none of oh. the handshaking events. I don't get to wear a tux. I don't, oh. none of that is happening, but, and there, I allow that moment of sort of sadness, mm-hmm. but it's, it's a great reminder about what's important because that's all great. And maybe it'll happen again. Maybe it won't. Maybe, but how great that we get to experience this random here. Like we had, um, you know, it's going to, a party's a party, but we had to do a zoom call with the other nominees this week. And, uh, you know, I'm in a zoom call with Trent Reznor of nine inch nails. Oh my God. What is happening? <laughs> like, what is your life? Like who, what, and he's looking at, you know, he's looking at my bathroom door behind me and my <laughs> plant that's dying. Like, what? What? This isn't, this is weird. This is definitely weird. And what do you say? And it makes it just funny. It makes yeah. it, you can laugh and um, enjoy the strangeness of it all. I will tell you a little secret. Oh, yes. Just I'm between listening. us. Just between okay. us. Um, the main Emmy broadcast uh, the the big event. We'll have some live elements, and it's going to be a big show, I'm sure. Mm. But uh, we are part of the what they call the below the line categories, where we're on a separate night. Oh, uh, and uh, which is normal. That's cool. That that I was already expecting. Yeah. Uh, but normally there is a there is a an actual ceremony that you go to. But this year, clearly there isn't. It's online, mm. but it's it's all pre recorded, pre taped. We had to submit to them. Uh, acceptance speech in case we win it's already felt like we had to film a 30 second speech and send it to them oh. and so <laughs> there we are like Curtis and I just laughing because we're like we can't pretend they said like pretend that you've won and I, we're like I'm, I, I can't pull I don't remember it. the acting exercise for that moment yeah that, that's <laughs> and that's just gonna read fake and so we we made a fun video that hopefully is charming if people see it and uh, yeah but you know, it so just, if, it, if you don't win, will you be able to make that video available anyway? It's ours. We'll, we'll post it. We'll okay. Post it. Yeah. Either way, it's going to be, it's worth saying. I will give one hint. My third grade music teacher is involved. Oh my gosh. Is your third grade music teacher still alive? Yeah. Is this teacher freaking out of their minds excited for you she was so great happy to get this phone call and it was so much fun to talk to her and she is so tech savvy i yeah. didn't have to like i she was ready to zoom call she was all she's she's still amazing oh my gosh i cannot age. wait to see it 
Yeah. So, so the, the point of all that is, is again, it's not what I expected this moment to be. It's not mm-hmm. the dream, but it is so funny and fun and random. And yeah. we're going to have a red carpet with my family and friends that night <laughs> where everyone's going to get like their worst bridesmaid dress, or they're going to take <laughs> towels and make turbans. And we're all going to get dressed up for the hour before the ceremony and have a red carpet. And am I going to remember that? Sadly, no. How right. awesome that I get to do that with, you know, my nieces and, nep- my nieces and nephews and yeah. my friends. That, that, they wouldn't get to be there if mm. it was a regular time. And now mm-hmm. I can share it with them. So it's, it's, I love how adaptable you are. Oh, well, I try. I mean, that's personality. That is, if there, <laughs> if, I, if there is such a thing as a, um, of living multiple lives and, and reincarnation, this life is definitely about adaptability for me <laughs> because that's my struggle. I am, I'm a type A planner. Oh. I like to plan things. I like to think, and I've chosen a career path that you can't do that. And yeah. so I'm actively working against this type. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm the same. I'm very, look, I've got, I'm not kidding right now. I've got, <laughs> let, me, let me just grab one. Well, hang on one more pile. Five <laughs> journals for planning things. And I finally went to, because 2020 just screwed me on every planner ever. I'm never buying a planner again. Yes. <laughs> I've got tons. I'm, I'm holding them up. Well, so I switched to Rocket Books because you can uh, erase them. <laughs> Smart. And I'm like, yeah, never ever. Biggest waste of money was a 2020 planner. <laughs> and that, there's the lesson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's hard being type A in, uh, in, um, in, this, in a world that's rapidly changing. Yeah, it is. It's... Um, as someone who like to have my n- next year planned out, mm-hmm. uh, I can't plan my next two weeks right now. Yeah. I mean, I can plan <laughs> basically I mean, what I'm going to be. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up, take the dog for a walk, sit at my dining room table and work and mm-hmm. try to write. And that's going to be kind of it. But yeah. the, the grander scheme stuff, I can't. I, I don't know. I don't know when we're working on two musicals right now. Mm-hmm just turned in drafts of them stage musicals and th- I don't know when they'll see yeah. the light of day. I don't know when they'll see a stage. I can't, I can't plan that. I have to just let that go and do the work and hope that they'll be back on stage at some point. Yeah. I mean, just like release, release the outcome mm-hmm. to whatever will be. And, you know, and not to be, I am in a privileged position in which uh, I have a spouse who has a great job that's been consistent during this time. Mm. Uh, I do some, still do some freelance copy editing, copy um, work for advertising once in a while, which was my survival job for many years uh-huh. in New York. Um, so I, I can wait. I can wait until those shows are ready again. I can wait until TV production is back up and maybe we'll get hired to write more songs, you know, like, yeah. I, I have that ability and I know so many friends who don't and mm. those people, you know, that is where the struggle is really tough to, to think about like how, how do you ride this wave? Because it is such a big wave that is sending people far away from their path and yeah. how to survive with that. And I, I, I never, there's never a day that I take for granted right now the, the privilege I have to be able to sort of wait this out a little bit. Mm, mm-hmm. So is there anything, um, I, I like to say uh, 2020 is generous with its lessons. <laughs> is, there a, is there anything that, you're, that you see yourself carrying over from this time once we're in a post-COVID era? Yeah. Um, there's... On a personal level, the connection to my extended family was deepened during this time because we Zoomed more. You know, these are people I didn't talk to very often. They're very close to my heart and we would see each other once in a while, but we had Zoom meetings with my cousins and uh, the extension of this family and a family of friends that met 
more regularly and strangely had the time to sort of, we would have cocktail hour on Zoom. And that has been gratifying because we can live very closed, small existences um, when we're focused on work. And it's good to remind ourselves of we are more than just our job <laughs> and not yeah. our, our identity is not all tied up in what we do. Um, and that's great to be a reminder and, and we be reminded of and take that forward out of this mm. because so many of us had our jobs taken away and we can realize, okay, I'm not just my job. I, I am many things. And that's what I will take forward uh, personally on the job front. It's the same lesson I've been trying to learn for 20 years. You know, <laughs> flexibility. Flexibility. Flexibility, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and let myself off the hook. I have friends who, um, you know, I, for lack of a better way to put it, I want to punch in the face about two months of the pandemic because they were talking about like, oh, I've got so much time. I'm writing the novel. I didn't. Oh, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't feel creative. No, I didn't, I didn't either. I didn't want to sit down and write the great American novel. I didn't, yeah. even if I wanted to, you know, I, I just didn't feel it. There's enough stress, the toll of our political climate, the toll of the pandemic, uh, the toll of the reckoning of justice in our society. Mm -hmm. That's real. And hey, if, if you don't feel like writing, I don't blame you because I didn't for, for a lot of it. Um, I had job stuff that I had to get done mm -hmm. and the training and the years of work have taught me how to, Hey, I have to finish the draft of this musical. I'm going to sit down and do the work, mm -hmm. but I wasn't, you know, I'm not writing. It wasn't your other. flow state. Yeah, it wasn't that. It, and it wasn't a, God, I feel so inspired to write six other things in my off time. And I've got, mm -hmm. because I've got this extra 10 hours that I'm not running around town. No. No, I did my job. I, I work hard at it, but mm -hmm. I'm not. Yeah, that's, that's not happening during this time. And right. I will take forward the difference between those two states and that it's okay to, to live in one without the other. That mm -hmm. I can, I have the skills to sit down and do work. And it's a job. And it is a great job. I'm so <laughs> lucky that when I say I sit down to do my job, sometimes that's writing a scene, writing a funny scene in it for a musical. Mm. Um, but it's a job and that's work. Mm. And there's a difference between uh, the two of just being in a creative flow and one with the muses. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and that's okay. Sometimes that's not going to happen. Yeah. And sometimes you need to just rely on your discipline yep and write and write stuff that's bad and then you'll revise mm -hmm. it just let yourself off the hook yeah editors are wonderful yeah. oh yeah that's what uh, having a writing partner in your life is great for like yeah. we have we have a built-in editorial system curtis and i oh he's, nice he's my editor and i'm his editor yeah and that's what's great about having a 20 some year relationship um it's a long marriage and it is a marriage I, yeah i mean you can own it own the years i mean like i said before i hit record i mean somewhere there is a painting of you that is growing just more hideous and decrepit by the moment <sighs> don't please don't find it please don't no. find it uh it's yeah it's thank you thank you for the compliment no no i don't one of the things that's funny you bring that up uh one of the big changes of moving to LA just me that I personally found, I don't know if it's true for everyone, is I found that there are a lot of stereotypes about Los Angeles and California that are not true. Mm. But one that I experienced was the ageism of the city and the ageism mm. of the culture here. Uh, and I actively was like, no, I'm, I am proud of my 48 years. I am proud that I have taken this circuitous path and had wonderful adventures in my life that are have added some mileage to my to my odometer. But um, yeah, there's definitely times here where it, people. Uh, my favorite. Uh, my husband was at the gym, and someone was trying to pick him up. I think, which is we've been together for twenty years. <laughs> enjoy, enjoy, have someone flirting with you, yeah. and 
the person, uh, my husband said something that indicated his age. And the person goes, wait, 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 how old are you? And Travis said, well, I'm 41. And they, the person stopped. I mean, that is so brave of you to admit. <laughs> <laughs> Which was the most funny thing I think I've ever heard in my life. Uh, to be over 40, to admit you're over 40 is brave. That is so uh, brave. That's so brave of you. So brave. Uh, so brave. Um, but it, I, I do find that there's a, there's a hide your age at all costs mm. a quality out here that can be a challenge. It can be yeah. a challenge to walk into a room to, to audition for a job, so to speak, and know that Somewhere they're thinking, well, wouldn't you rather have a 25-year-old to, to, to do this? Um, no. <laughs> I'll say no. Uh, sometimes yes, but uh, if that 25-year-old had walked into Maisel, I, without those years of being able to, we had to jump in and, and Curtis jumped in and conducted one of the sessions. We wow. did arrangements on some of the songs. We were on set because of our experiences in all these different ways. You know, I was able to talk to actors because I was an actor. I was able to talk to the actor who's playing Shy Baldwin mm -hmm. and talk about like, well, this is what we're thinking and have a conversation that was useful. And we got to do all that because we had those years of experience. We weren't just, here's a song, drop it off. Yeah. Um, and and how much more rich? An experience and rich of a performance, probably because of that. I hope so. I mean, I hope we were additive to the process, and mm -hmm. um, I think we were. I believe we were, and they certainly invited us back to write more, and we were involved the whole season long. In the end, instead of just the first episode that we had originally been talk to talk to them about. Mm -hmm. So, yes, and that was great, and uh, to to be able to collaborate on multiple levels outside our, what you would think our box was, was a great thing. And what we, you know, that's what we bring to the table is our years of random experiences. <laughs> uh, to wrap up our journey through the labyrinth, um, is there an adventure? Cause I don't want to, I don't want to lose that little nugget. You happen to mention an adventure or one of one of your ex years of experience that has um, made it into a song or made it into a show or um, something that maybe no no one would have thought of. Oh gosh! I mean, the, the truth is, is that it's everywhere. It's. I mean, uh, I'm writing. You're writing four characters, but a piece of you is always there. Uh, you know. It, the, it's not in a fun way, oh. but you know, I don't, not, not, it's not a sad way either, but in, a, um, in a, an emotional, sentimental way, this, there's a song in Maisel at the heart of this, this season, and I won't give spoilers, but it's the climax of Shy Baldwin's story, and he sings a song at that point called No One Has to Know, mm. and it, it's, it's me. It's him, but it's me. And it's, it takes, it's, it's looking back on that college kid who was starry eyed and in love, but afraid to say it to people. And was afraid to own who he was in some ways. And, you know, that's always with me. And it was great to be able to put that into, into words and song. And yeah. it was a song that my husband heard it the first time and goes, that song is the most you I've ever heard you write. That's Aww. you in that song, which is, if you, if you know the moment, I was like, wait a second, what are you trying to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's, it's, no it's, spoilers, it's, no spoilers, but it's, yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a melancholy moment, <laughs> and, <laughs> but what he saw was the romanticism oh, and, yeah. and the, uh, the hopefulness that, that is in that song as well, um, and you know, that's, that's me. That is you. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm happy to be here. I hope that was helpful in some way. It was wonderful. You rambling on. It was, it was perfect. Absolutely perfect. Thanks again, Tom. And if y'all want to get more of Tom Miser, please visit his website at thomasmiser.com. It will be linked in the show notes. 
Thank you all for listening. If you liked this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at beckybrett.live for daily inspiration, information, and support. If you're looking for a coach, the link to my application is in the show notes, and I can't wait to hear from you. Enjoy the journey, everyone, and remember, you can lose yourself in a maze, but you can find yourself in a labyrinth.